So thank you very much for coming here today. Um, today, I want to talk about building applications that are powered by machine learning, and they are also real time. And we need to get the insight immediately. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate that uh, on a practical uh, use case, which I'm going to code live with you here to have more fun. Um, I'm Thomas Neubauer, I'm CTO and co-founder of Quix. And I want to share with you a bit of the story how I got to this and how I get into streaming and building real-time applications and I, how, how I found it problematical um, and difficult. So uh, the founding team of Quix, we were working together in Macquarie. And I was leading a team of engineers that was um, working in the racing trying to improve the stack and architecture of telemetry acquisition from F1 cars. So uh, they were thick client architecture. People were traveling around the world every second weekend to be able to work with the data in the paddock and, and react fast when something happens. And it's quite a challenging use case because the amount of data that's coming from each car is humongous. It's roughly 30 million numerical values per minute from each car. And some of the sensors are really high resolution. So some of the gearbox sensors, for example, are up to 4 kilohertz um, data. So that means 4,000 different numerical numbers from just one sensor in a second. And we quickly realized that none of the solution that would involve a database in the middle of the architecture would really work because there wasn't basically a database that would be able to persist and query that amount of data at the same time without huge, huge delay. So we look around and we adopted Apache Kafka and we actually made that work and data were streaming from the, from the race, uh, race tracks around the world uh, into, into the cloud and we thought that we have solved the problem. But actually, we haven't, because nobody from a number of cross-functional teams in a factory could really, really leverage this tech. Why? Well, because streaming is not really uh, living in the world of Python. And our teams were full of ML engineers, data scientists, mechanical engineers. And, and they wanted to use Python and its ecosystem, possibly MATLAB but none of them really want to use Java. And, and so I, that was the first moment I really realized that there's a big gap in tooling for Python around Kafka and Kubernetes when you want to run your, your services. And not just that, uh, I quickly saw that to build successfully real-time uh, pipelines in your, in your application, really requires a deep software engineering skill set. And, and that's something that was lacking in all of the teams that were using this, this uh, pipeline. Basically, to move from the batch to real time, it's all the technology more complex than just working with the data that you have under your finger, finger part. So at that moment, I was thinking, well, uh, this is not sustainable to go team by team and constantly basically explain um, a sort of engineering things like you know running containers like gracefully shut down them how to do checkpointing in Kafka how to do stateful processing how to manage the state all of that was not sustainable to scale in the organization so um, before we go to the actual um, architecture can I just ask you to understand my audience who, use, who is using Kafka in their company right now? OK. Who is using streaming? Bit less, but very similar, yeah. Who is using Python? OK, cool. Thank you. So today, I want to, I want to demonstrate how to build such application on a concrete example, which would be a fitness app that will be sending Telemetry data from a handlebar. So imagine you're cycling, you have your phone on a handlebar, it's sending GPS location, GeForce data, speed, all of that stuff. And then we're going to use 
machine learning model that we have trained on the historic data to predict that you have crashed. And we're going to immediately inform family members. And we're going to consume that data in a fleet-style web, web, web application um, with a map and everything. And um, first of all, let's discuss the architecture. How are we going to actually deploy the model? Because that's uh, quite important here. And um, because we're going to use streaming, uh, a bit of a spoiler alert there, uh, let's discuss the, the landscape of a streaming. So first, we're going to get data from a phone into a gateway. So let's actually do that. So I would get my phone here and uh, start the company app. Everything I show you today, it's open source um, code samples that you can find on our GitHub. And you can basically replicate exactly what I'm doing by yourself. This app is on a store as well, if you don't want to go to the compilation and all of that stuff. So um, here I have a Quix platform, which I'm going to use today to build this application. And I have here one workspace, which is for this demo. You can think of workspace as a sandbox environment for your infrastructure, your code, and your data. So you can have different ones for different projects. Now, here I have pre-deployed two microservices just to get a start quicker. One is to pair my phone to this workspace, not important. Second is this um, front-end application that will be one of the way how you can consume the result of the work of today. So here you see I'm in a Berlin. I am 300 whatever meters above the sea level, which I don't know this accuracy, sorry. Now, yeah, GPS is getting there. And if I shake, you see it's going up and down because it's recalibrated. So it's all good. I have 76% of the battery, so I'm all set up. Now, what I want to achieve here today is if I shake with this model, uh, phone, I'm not going to crash here. So if I shake with this phone, I want to get alert based on the previous shaking that, that uh, I'm doing that, and I want to get it immediately, not in five minutes or one hour. So how are we going to do that today? Well, first, we need to get the data into our pipeline. And because Kafka is not really well designed to um, connect to end devices, we need to f first put some middleware, some gateway service between the Kafka and possibly 1,000 devices out there. So I'm going to create a new entry point here, and I'm going to call it WebSocket Service. And this will go to phone data topic. And don't do that. Don't connect directly to Kafka. It's not going to scale. Um, Kafka is more of a one-to-one -one or one-to-little consumer. Um, the technology is not one-to-million and devices. Second problem is that uh, you want a protocol that is able to handle poor conditions of your network, for example. So here, now we can see that I'm getting actually messages from my phone, and that's great. I can also um, explore this data here and get a GeForce data. So as a, as a data scientist, I can first make sure that I'm getting the live data, but then this is not really useful to do any meaningful analysis because the data are just flowing and I can't really get a hand on them. So what I'm going to do is go to topics. And here, I already done that. I will enable the persistence on that topic. That means that the data will sync into a, a database which handle different type of data for me to analyze it first in this simple uh, simple uh, hmm? something happened with my let's try it again <laughs> so I can I can get the there we are I can get the data here find what I want uh, you know imagine this could be very long stream get the right data and then with the code, I can get that into Jupyter Notebook, which is what we have done before. 
I'm not going to train the model today here, because that will be quite long. But basically, with this, we get the different streams that happened in the past, and we analyze the data. We label when we were shaking, when we were not. So we have some walking on the stairs, cycling, being in a car. And then uh, we have done some feature engineering. Um, so we have add new columns based on the raw columns. And then we have trained the model using TensorFlow library. And uh, that, that's what you can see there. And at the end, uh, there is some backtesting with unseen data, classical ML, ML stuff. What is important, though, is what we're going to do now. Now we have trained the model. And um, the question is, how are we going to move it into production so we see it in the app? And that's really the question of today. So going back to the presentation, um, so we have get the data straight to the topic. I have showed you that. And then we have persisted the data. And we have loaded into some sort of call up SageMaker to do the analysis and actual training. And now we're going to push that model as a pickle into model registry. Doesn't matter what type of model registry, really. But we're going to use that model straight in a Python service. It will be consuming data from this topic. And when there is a crash or shaking happening, we're going to send messages into different topic. And that topic is also being consumed using a WebSocket service by our front-end application, which means that then we don't have to persist it at all. The data will be flowing completely without database in an in a equation. Now, obviously, you're going to probably want to persist data still, because you might want to retrain your model. You might want to look back what's happening. You want to assess the quality of your model. But it's no longer a, a, um, a bit of your architecture that will cause any delay and you will be querying all the time. This time, you use the database for what it's meant to be, and that's persisting data, not processing data. So um, that leads us to the ML deployment. Now, there's a couple of different ways how we can deploy this model. And each has pros and cons. And one of the most used ones that you probably saw many times is when you basically deploy your model as a service with, with API, web API where the, imp the input variables are co in a request, HTTP request. And then internally, you call the, the artifact. And you in a response, you return if it's crashed or not. Now, there are some issues with this approach. Uh, so the first problem is that there's a bit of a CPU overhead uh, in involved in an API orchestration if you're doing it at this scale. So this is. Uh, 10 times per second stream. Now imagine you have hundreds, thousands of phones doing that. A lot of unnecessary CPU. Um, there is a bit of a delay, but that's probably not a problem. What is the problem, though, is that what's going to happen if your service can't keep up with a spike of requests that just happen? Even though if you deploy this into some auto-scale engine, Autoscale doesn't work in a split of a second. So what's going to happen is that this service will take longer and longer to respond. Up to the moment when that is longer than the client timeout, and it's gone. You have disruption in your service. You're losing the request. And well, that could be someone's crash, or that could be a fraudulent transaction in a bank. And that's not great. You can obviously scale this, but you never have, you don't know what's going to happen uh, five minutes from now. So the solution for that, and that's what I want to show you today, is um, stream processing approach to deploying ML model. So we're going to use pop and sub service that will um, process data with the model directly on top of Kafka. Um, and when, you when you're creating a stream processing application, you basically have two 
uh, major directions that you can go with. Architecture decisions. The first one is using Kafka client libraries uh, in any language you want and do it by yourself. And the second option is to use a big stream processing frameworks like Fling, Spark Streaming, or Dataflow with Apache Beam. Now, um, there's not a silver bullet, of course. And let's just walk us through the pros and cons. So the first one is very elegant, lightweight solution. You can use any language almost that you can think of. And um, you don't bring any dependency to your project and to your code, uh, a part of the small library, whatever that's Python, Java, .NET. Um, and it's actually worked quite well for one message at a time processing or stateless processing. When you just look at the message by message and you don't care about the context between the messages. Uh, and you can quite nicely deploy it to, uh, with your service to existing orchestration like Kubernetes. The problem is where you start to look at stateful processing, when you actually care about the different messages coming to the pipe, and you might want to do a rolling window of five minutes, or, or you just want to look at the five previous transactions of that person in a, in a bank, that moment, this approach gets to a serious software engineering area. And, and you, really know, you really need to know how Kafka works. And um, it's just not doable and not wise, I would say, to, to build this from scratch uh, for most companies. Now, at that point, you might be tempted, well, I'm going to use stream processing framework like Fling. And I will get all these features out of box. And that's true. But you, at that moment you do that decision, you increase the complexity of your project by order of multitude. You need another um, code, code uh, orchestration engine, Flink. You are bringing new language, uh, the, the Flink DSL, to your, to your stack. You get heavily involved in a, well, you're bringing a lot of JVM stuff in your, into, your, into your project. And also, for developers that are using the Fling, there are some problems with, you know, you, you, you can't debug that easily your code line by line, and you can't just slap that code to your microservice because you're actually not building any code. You're describing something in the Fling DSL, and then you publish the job to Fling server, and the Fling would do the job, uh, not your code. Um, so, when you try to use Fling or Spark Streaming from Python, it's not easy and it's not smooth, exactly because um, uh, it's actually all running on, on, on JVM. And if you, if you try PyFling, for example, you very quickly end up in Stack Overflows like that. And um, connecting Fling to Kafka might be difficult because, again, you are not relying on, on client libraries. You're relying on Fling Connector. And then might be missing some features for some exotic Kafka configurations. And, and at the end, if you manage to connect it, well, uh, at the beginning, it might look great because you get, for example, SQL, and you can write SQL transformations. But that's for POC. But when you want to get something real, you will quickly end up building your user-defined functions. And then you will find to do that in Python. It's, uh, it's not great. And the reason is, if you look at the official documentation, this is how it's done. You run, you're running two VMs, sorry, two run times. There is a bridge between Java and Python. And well, that's what it is. So what we really, I believe, all want is to find the problems like that, uh, line by line, and get really what the variables are, what's going on there, and fix it. And so, um, is there a third way? Well, obviously there is. That's why, <laughs> that's why I want to show you today. And uh, to be fair, we are not the first ones that had this idea. Um, but outside of Python, um, that's, for example, Kafka Streams. So if you, if you want to use Java, uh, you can use Kafka Streams library. And it's very similar uh, for different audience and different type of projects. But they basically solve. Uh, stream processing with the library, 
but with the functions to do stateful processing. So we're going to do that as well. And what that actually means. So today, I'm going to build a microservice that actually under the hood doing this. So you're getting the messages from, from, from a topic. And then you need to split them into streams. Because what we need to make sure is that data from my phone don't get mixed up with the phone data of another phone. And especially for stateful processing, that alignment is important. Then we're not sending one timestamp per message. That would be wasteful. Um, if you have high resolution data like this, what you're doing usually is that you're putting more rows into one message. But then when you're processing your data, that might get a bit tricky. So we need to kind of abstract the developer from the idea that there is something like a message because there's actually just rows flowing to the system, somehow packaged in the messages. And then when you get there, and we just have a continuous stream of data, because this is going to be stateful processing, we're going to have to maintain the state. And um, that's probably going to be in memory, because if we're going to touch the disk every message that's happening 10 times per second, we're going to murder the performance. But occasionally, we're going to have to save this to actual disk to make sure that when we restart the service or we just have a hardware failure, we're going to get back to the state or we, we had. And most importantly, that state is aligned with the, the message we're going to process next. And, and then we're going to combine the input data with this state to produce output. In our case, input data from my phone with the state, is it the crash or not? And we're going to align and synchronize all of that with Kafka checkpointing and offset management. And what we have done in our quick streams library um, is we have taken all of that and we have packaged it to Pandas interface. So what you're basically doing is you're writing like you would do in Jupyter Notebook offline on a static data, but actually under the hood, we're working with the data flowing through your code. So, but you don't need to learn the streaming specifics, the streaming thinking to, to do that. And, and you're just using a traditional, well-known uh, code that you have used before. And we take care of the state management, checkpointing, serialization, serialization, et cetera. So how it's going to work, and how this actually going to make resilient and production-grade pipeline? Well, we're going to combine Kafka, Python, and Kubernetes all working together and using features of each technology to do that. And we're going to build a microservice that will take the input, call the model inside in memory, and publish the results output topic. We're going to scale the consumer group to multiple replicas and use Kafka checkpointing and consumer group system together with Kubernetes stateful set um, concept to build this in a horizontally scalable fashion with the resiliency of a Kafka lock inside. So what that means is that the topic, the topic partitions will redistribute to different replicas, and where we're going to have a copy of our model. And if we have a hardware failure on a compute side in our Kubernetes, whether that's a bug in your code or possibly a node getting murdered, uh, then um, the others will take the load, and you can have a standby instances. And equally, if we have the problem in a Kafka broker, well, we just set the re replica to two or three, and the new leader will be elected, and the streaming is ensured. So let's do it. Let's build that up um, now. So I have yeah, some time. So first, um, I'm going to go to pipeline. And I'm going to create a new node here. So you see the data is flowing in. So I'm going to create a new transformation. And here, uh, I have Quick's uh, mono repository with code samples and connectors, all open source. So you can either use code samples as a starter 
or if you, for example, syncing data to database or connecting to something else, there are also ready made uh, connectors that you can either use as they are or just fork them to your workspace and change a couple lines of code to suit your particular use case. So I'm going to use Tartar Transformation. This is like a, a microservice recipe. They're going to have everything you need to start working. So it has a Docker file to build into Docker container. It has a Helm chart. It has all environment variables set up to connect to your infrastructure, whatever that is. And that's obviously hold in, in workspace settings. So basically, what you do here is you just give it a name, where you want to get data in, and where you want to get out. And you save it as a project. And it will create a new Git repository with everything here. So now what you can do is hopefully you can read that. Um, what you can do is clone it using the Git and use your PyCharm, Visual Studio Code, do the debugging as you want. Or if you don't want to, you can also use uh, this web IDE, which right now just spin up a port in Kubernetes for me with all the dependencies I need. So what I'm going to do here is if I just write here, print df, so you get how to complete everything, and I press run, it will pick up the, co sorry, the, the data from my phone, and I'm ready to build. So there you are. You see, timestamps, everything. I can work with this data now. So this is how quickly you build a microservice. Uh, and now it's just about your Python and your knowledge. So uh, I have here um, the shade detection, which now I'm going to build with you. So first thing we're going to do is that when we have this callback, which is uh, done per, uh, per device, uh, I'm going to get the actual streaming data frame. So it is not real data frame, because obviously I don't have any data um, in my code. It's just a flow of data. But it's going to look like that. So df equal input stream no df. And because I don't need all the columns, I just going to need a GeForce data. I'm going to do projection like that. Um, and this is just a classical way how we would do this. And then I will uh, also set some uh, header width, just so we fit it in the screen. And I will print the header. And then print the rows. Good. So let's see. Amazing. Now I'm going to make it a bit smaller so we can see. So now, what you see now is timestamp and three columns, sometimes none. We're going to get rid of them. Don't worry. So now if I, if I shake, you see that one of the columns going up. So we have data in my code. And we have this frame being populated with the data. So first thing we're going to do here is we're going to filter the columns we don't need. Again with a traditional pandas way of doing things. And then our ML model, and I'm going a bit ahead of myself here, because I'm going to start before the model, before the ML, just with the math. But um, we're using a feature called GeForce Total, which is a combined um, amount of forces applied to this phone regardless of the direction. So it doesn't matter how you put your phone on a handlebar, it will always be the same. And I have it here because we have obviously used that. So that's this one. And the beauty of this approach is that you can move the code from Jupyter Notebook to production without any dialects, you know, without any uh, different SQL dialects, like when you do KSQL with BigQuery, for example. When you have training SQL, very different engine than um, um, runtime SQL. And now I'm just going to paste it here. And then it would be really tricky to just rely on one timestamp. 
it, do it doesn't tell us you that amount of lot of information. So what we're going to do is look at the rolling window of 10 seconds. Is there any sort of long-term um, um, high GeForce situation? So I'm going to create a new column, a new feature, GeForce total 10 seconds. And here, I'm going to use the GeForce total as input. And as you would do in Pandas, I'll do a rolling 10 seconds mean. So let's run this. So if I scroll to the top, you see the columns, timestamp GeForce X, epsilon Z, total and total rolling window. So if I go to the leading edge, we have 10 Gs, because that's the gravitational forces of this planet. And if I go up, you see that the second last column going immediately up and the last column going slowly up. That's because that's the rolling window of 10 seconds. Now, what we want to achieve here is now if I stop this stream, we're not going to start from 10, but we need to start from this moment, the 18 Gs or something. And so if I press run again, this will catch up with the last, if I scroll up, you see, 17.9. Uh, so what we have done here is that we, we, we check pointing the state and the Kafka topic same time, at the same time. So when we get restarted, we go back to that point, and our state is one, on one, one to one with the next message we're going to process. That means we're not going to corrupt the state and output topic with a false um, invalid data. So now this looks great, but obviously we have come here today to use ML, don't we? So now I'm going to go to this Jupyter notebook, and I'm going to use this code to load the actual pickle file into my service. And it's going to work like this. I have pre-configured the requirement.txt here. Um, where is it? Readme repo requirement. With all the Python libraries I need to run the TensorFlow model. And you can put anything here up to like OpenCV computer vision libraries. You basically have the whole Python ecosystem in your disposal. And that's so much more easier than you would have if you were building a Fling SQL transformations. So now I have my model. And the only thing I need to do is here create yet an another shaking column. And that's just going to be uh, this predict function, which is how I'm going to call my model. So I'm going to put it here. There we are. And so that's about it. And to be able to consume it in this front-end application we have seen at the beginning, I just need to write the output to the output topic, because I haven't done that yet. Luckily, that's just a one-liner. So um, output stream write row. Now, what this does is basically output that message with the new columns we have introduced to different topic, which is called whatever fleet and uh, we selected when we are creating this service. And that is consumed by our front end. So if I press run, now you see that the last column is 0. That means there is no shaking involved. And now this is um, catching up. Maybe it's already catch up, good. So now, if I shake three once, that's basically shaking being detected by our TensorFlow model. And if I go to this and I shake, it's working. So we have now a real-time pipeline powered by machine learning. And there's only one last step to move this into production. And that's to deploy this code from my IDE into something like Kubernetes. And that's luckily a one dialog away. So now I go to Git here. 
And either from my laptop, if I'm doing it locally, or from here, if I'm doing it from the web browser, doesn't really matter. I give it a version. And then I press Deploy, select that version, give it some memory, some, some CPU, and enable the state management, because this is a stateful processing, although now with the ML it isn't. But uh, you give it a state size, and you press Deploy. And what's going to happen is that we're going to build this microservice with the Docker in it and with the Helm chart into the pipeline. And we're going to run it as a container that in a, in a quick streams library, there's all these grateful shutdowns implemented. So when you're rolling new updates, when you're stopping and starting it, it's all behaving as it should. So you don't have to care of that. And you get logs, CPU monitoring, stream lineage. And, and you can preview, obviously, the results of your model together with the input data to assess its quality as well. And you can publish the KPIs real time as well, by the way. So uh, I hope it made sense. And um, if you want, try it by yourself. With this QR code, um, you can use that open source code I showed you. Plus, you can use our platform as well. Just sign up, put your, put your email, and you will get quite generous resources as well. And you can just follow this um, uh, tutorial and build it for yourself. Thank you very much for coming here and listening to my talk. And if you have any questions, I'm here, or obviously after the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for the great talk and the very cool demo. Do you have any questions in the audience? Yes. Hello. Um, so I'm wondering, because there were models um, in the presentation, and as we all know, um, the larger the model, the more latency in the streaming. So are there any policies for that case? For latency? For, for model latency. Yeah, well, it really depends on your model. So this model is quite lightweight. So I think it's introducing like 40 milliseconds delay. But if your model is going to introduce 10 seconds, nothing going to happen. It's just that the whole pipeline will be 10 seconds late. But because you have a lock, so basically the data are flowing from topic to the topic to the topic. If you have 10 jumps, it doesn't matter. You have 10 locks. And you also embed, you bake the timestamp to the data. So you are aware at the end that you have some delay. That's, for example, why, just I want to show you this here. If I go to topics, to phone data, uh, and print it again, if I start it, there is a delay. You can observe in a, there we are. So if I just put some, so this is the delay, yeah, 0 0.2 seconds. So you would just have 10 seconds if it's very ha okay, heavy. OK, so model. for more real time, you could also technically like filter the, the resolution, like uh, predict that every tenth interpolation. Yes. You, and so, then it would be faster? Yes. So for example, in computer vision, that's quite often the case. You can skip 10 frames and do analysis every 10, every 10 frames to reduce the CPU and OGPU load. Yeah, that's. It's quite nice if it works out of the box. <laughs> yeah, so here it's basically uh, it's one line. It's one line. So you set the con the buffer, uh, and you say I want the buffer to give me a frame every second of worth of data. Not every second in a clock of your computer, but one second of data. And then you can do some aggregation, or just take the first row or last row, move it, put it to the model, and that's it. And then you're reducing the yeah. Nice, thanks. Thanks. Are there any more questions? No. Nope. I'll check if there's online anything. Nope, there is not. Well then, thank you very much um, for joining us and this great last talk today. And I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much.